So how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I got back from Hawaii, so I'm yeah. relaxed. So what'd you do in Hawaii? I went hiking. I went to the beach, and I just did a lot of nothing. So Yeah? Yeah. For people that don't know, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. Um, what are I... all the things that you do? Because a lot of people don't know how you get to be where you are with 35 million people that get up every day and check to see what you're doing, who you're doing it with, everything that involves being Amanda Cerny. Tell me how you decided to do that and how you got from the day you decided to do that to how you got to where you are today. Yeah, well, for me, I wanted to do acting. So I right. was like, all right, you know, to do that, I need a manager and an agent. And then everybody I met with was like, you need a reel. So I was like, all right, I have to build a reel for myself. So I started acting in some of my friends' YouTube videos because they did YouTube at the time. And then I was like, all right, this is cool, but I want to create my own content too. But I have no idea how to edit. I have no idea how to write these scripts. Like I've never done it before. And then this app called Vine came out. And right. I think that was in like 2012-ish. Um, so I started using that right away. And I started doing like comedy on there just to begin with. And if I look back now, those were so cringy, like just to watch and look back yeah. on because it, it got better over time. We're all that way. We yeah. go back and look at the first things we did. Hey, if, if we're not like that, we haven't progressed. So I think it's a good sign that I feel that way. But um, then I was able to better my content and I was noticing that I was getting like a thousand views. And for me at the time, I'm like, that's a lot of people watching my stuff. So I started making more and more and more, and I did it consistently. I did it every single day. I was making sure that I was producing content or doing collaborations with other people that were doing something similar to me on the platform as well. So I kind of made it my goal to really grow on that app because I saw it growing. I saw the growth, which was a great incentive for me and like really exciting. And it became like a almost like a numbers game too because you saw – different people becoming number one on the platform and then so you would kind of fight for different spots on so you were just on youtube well i was acting in youtube videos but it was all youtube it yeah. was just that one platform yeah for the beginning when i first started acting right. and then vine so vine yeah. was the main well, vine was six seconds though right? yeah yeah so what do you do for six seconds <laughs> it's, it was hard coming up with like different concepts every day but you basically try to make somebody laugh and so what seconds. was the first thing you did Oh, I think it was like one about people sliding into your DMs on Twitter. So it was like I just got single, but it was in real life. And then guys started popping up like with a big spoon behind me, like want a spoon and da da da. So it was like that was like my first one I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it improved. <laughs> people see that. And so they tell somebody and then somebody sees it and then they see it. Do they forward it on or repost it? Yeah. So they'll revine it. At yeah. the time, so a lot of people would rebind it to their own page, so their entire audience was able to see that vine that they yeah. shared on their page. And relatable stuff worked the best because everybody, like um, just like relationship stuff or just common situations you find yourself in, like those always just do the best out of anything. Just because people are more likely to share or tag their friends in it or be like, this is you, oh, this is so me. And it makes them feel like better about their lives, but be able to laugh at it as well. At some point, you had to decide, this is working. You had to be bumping along at what, like a thousand people watch or mm -hmm. 500 people, a thousand people. And then there had to be some point at which it jumped up. Yeah, I wouldn't say it necessarily immediately went from like a thousand to two million people watching just because I was posting every single day so I was able to see that gradual increase but that growth did happen over a year's time so it was like it was pretty fast of how fast like how quickly it was growing is there something you did because let me tell you people are really interested because in you know yeah. everybody wants to do what you've done. Yeah. Everybody now wants they to do. do. Before they didn't care. Yeah, but they do <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. All of a sudden now everybody's like, holy yeah. what is he, what's going on here? Yeah. Was there a point where there was something you did where you said, this is working, where there was a quantum shift? Yeah, I, 
I would say with that gradual growth over Vine, like just when I was solely focusing on comedy, like I, it was almost a a difficult process for me to brand myself into comedy because one being a pretty girl trying to do comedy, you get a lot of hate online. Um, initially I did. And then I just kept on with it, kept bettering my content and was persistent with it. And then I started to see the numbers really grow because I would read every single comment. So at first, like seeing like the hate online, I was like, oh gosh, you're so mean. But it was actually, some of it was constructive and I was able to like, all right, really just study comedy more, get into improv classes more and just like really focus on that. And then acting was always my goal, but then I saw opportunity with this, like you just said, yeah. and really just put all my focus into So what that. did the haters say? <laughs> um, slut <laughs> was a big yeah. one. I got that one a lot. Yeah. Um, and a lot of go kill yourself. Um, just like a lot of like, just the worst things somebody could say to you in person. <laughs> did it bother you? At first it did. Like, honestly, when I was just doing it on my own and just sitting there at home reading the comments alone, like it kind of gets to you. But and did then, you ever respond? Yeah. And that's when it stopped getting to me because I noticed every single time I responded and I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, you must have had a hard day. Like I responded with kindness every time. And then that got every single person I responded to immediately flipped and was like, I'm so sorry. I had such a hard day. I love you. I'm your biggest fan, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like these people that are just attacking in comments are just like, they're not stable themselves. So why should I let that yeah. affect me? But I mean, people do say hurtful things. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever go and check out their profiles and see who they were? Sometimes. And then I'd be like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> like, yeah. That's another reassurance. Uh, yeah. But I mean, we all have haters, right? Yeah. I mean, I get a lot of shut up, you bald headed hillbilly, Aww. you know, stuff like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, hillbilly, where'd they get that yeah. from too? I don't have an English accent. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it changed over time though. Like you start to grow a fan base and I start to grow a loyal one to the point where they defend you more than you would ever have to. So. Well, that's what happens with my wife, Robin. I mean, she's got <laughs> tons of followers. And if somebody comes on and says something mean about her, mm -hmm. she doesn't have to say anything. Yeah. It's like there's this mob that just <laughs> yeah. gets all up in that person's face and Love says, it. you know, what are you doing? Why are you saying that? That's not true. You don't know her. Where did you come from? Shut Love up. It. <laughs> it's like, oh, gee. Yeah, oh, it's like, on. all right, we'll mess with her. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I don't even want to say anything to her in yeah. case they're listening. <laughs> When did you hit a million people? Was that a red letter day? I know it was in the first year I started using Vine. Within that year, then I believe Instagram got video as well that was like 15 seconds long. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, okay, I can do 15 second videos That's now. That's like a feature film, yeah. right? <laughs> After you've like... been on Vine for six seconds, for now sure. you can do a punchline and set it up. It's just those extra seconds were like amazing but yeah. what we started like a lot of the influencers that were using vine started to do was do longer versions of what a vine was that was 15 seconds and then cut it down to a six second video and post it on vine which i think essentially killed the app yeah so define influencer when you say influencer wouldn't you say you're one of the top 10 influencers in the world um it just depends how you define it i guess if it's somebody that grew on social media from the beginning then right. yeah but if it's how do like, you define it i wouldn't define it that way i think it's anybody that has an audience that's following them that trusts in their word mm -hmm. like those are people they are influencing so essentially you're an influencer i'm an influencer but you're an influencer on the internet yeah that is a very specific vital demographic right yeah. i mean these are young people mm -hmm. they're on the move they're the demo that brands are looking for right right it's like coca-cola if they get someone at 12 13 18 mm -hmm. that's worth a whole lot more than if they get somebody at 55 because they've got them for 60 years as opposed to 15 years. So that person is worth a lot mm -hmm. to a brand if they get them. So that's a really vital audience. Yeah, yeah. And that's where that audience is. They're on the Internet. You know, they're not watching broadcast television the way they're on the Internet. They're doing both, but mm -hmm. they're really overrepresented on the Internet because yeah. that's where they're getting their information. A lot of kids don't really even understand cable 
anymore. Right. You know, they either have Netflix or YouTube Red or rewatch reruns or something from shows on YouTube. So yeah. So when you influence, what do you influence about, and how do you do it? And mine kind of goes everywhere nowadays like I because I have a following on Facebook I have a following on YouTube on Instagram on Snapchat like when Snapchat first started I was one of the first ones doing um, improv Snapchat stories for my audience so I just made public stories to help grow my account and I was the top 10 influencer on the app so when that came out I was just doing improv stories that entertain people and then on my Instagram, it was more scripted s- sketches. So I would just do focus on comedy on Instagram a lot, which is what really moved the needle for me. Um, but now I'll post in between like some photos from vacation or I'll just post um, uh, even videos from like because I'm doing a guest campaign right now. So I'll just post stuff from my like trip like I did in Turkey or some of the um, charity stuff that I do. I'll just like just to inspire the audience as well and, even I'll do posts now about sustainability and the environment. So I just, I, I'm kind of everywhere on, mm-hmm. on my platforms. But So what moves the needle the most? Comedy. Uh-huh. And if there's a type of comedy, what is it? Is there something that is your lane? Is there a power zone for you? Yeah, I would say the relatable comedy. So it's, it's more of... Um, for instance, if I'm like walking around and I something that happens to me in my everyday, I'll just write it down in my notes and find a way to exaggerate it or, you know, make it comedic in, the, in yeah. that sense. But so where do you get your sense of humor? I hang around a, a lot of comedians, so yeah. <laughs> and I was the youngest in my family, so I always had fun making fun of my sisters, which was the best. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think people? flock to you as opposed to somebody else there's something about you that resonates with them versus somebody else I wish I knew the answer to that I ask myself that every day I'm like why me but a lot of the time I think it is consistency I put a lot of effort into my posts that go out and across different platforms it's a lot of work (laughs) and in the meantime I am doing like the traditional film and tv stuff so it's it's a lot, but I, I think I was able to always grow with my audience and never really just stay in the same lane. Just always, I, and I think my audience really sees that and appreciates that and sees it within my content as well. Yeah. So maybe that's just a forever changing brand growth. Do you still have the desire to do acting in other mediums or are you satisfied to do what you're doing on the internet and in the things that you create yourself? I'm not satisfied with that yeah no just because I I have to produce everything I have to direct everything I have to write everything I have to edit a lot of things so for me it's it limits my capabilities and especially for acting I'm not able to give it my very best every single time and just because I'm focusing on somebody else's acting and directing that I'm like worrying about different elements that are going on so it's like it's very it's not the same as when I'm on set with um, a director who's been doing it like his entire life is solely yeah. directing. So yeah. it's nice to bring up the quality. I hear these kids because I have them on the show a lot where their parents say they're on the Internet all the time they're on the phone all the time. And they say, you know, I'm going to be an Internet star. Yeah. And I ask them, so what are you doing? They say, well, I just post a lot. I talk to people a lot. It seems to me they don't have a clue how much work's involved. Yeah. Because it is a lot of work. It's hours a day, right? Yeah. No, I think a lot of people on the internet probably, they definitely work more than a nine to five. I wake up, I'm starting to work, and I don't go to sleep until 4 a.m. a lot of the time. So, yeah. and that's solely just like working on a bunch of different things. So, so how many posts do you put up a day? Um, On Instagram, I'll do one or two. I used to do like, three but uh-huh. it's like I'm working on other things so it's I try to <laughs> balance everything but then I'll do two on YouTube um I'll do one on Facebook and then I'll fit in some snapchats here and there and it's the story so you may put up eight or ten things across all platforms yeah and then you're also responding to your audience like I make sure that I read all my comments and I'm like because that's what reading comments is what has really helped me to grow too. just hearing from your audience directly is nice but you don't answer everybody no I'll answer like 
I'll like like a lot of them because it's like time wise, <laughs> it's yeah. much, much more efficient. But I'll respond to probably like 10, 20 every post. Yeah. So I just make it a goal of mine. <laughs> It's just not the same 10. You just go through and pick different people? Yeah. What do they like do when you they respond? Um, they get excited, <laughs> and they probably share it on their pages and stuff too, but it just makes them feel good. At this point, you have to be recognized a lot. You and I have been together publicly, mm -hmm. and I've seen people come up to you, recognize you. They see you across the <laughs> way. What's that like? Is that good or bad? I think it's really cool i mean it started with vine like people would recognize me and be like you're that girl from vine yeah. and i'm like yeah i guess <laughs> and then now it's like people walk up oh you're that girl from instagram or you're that girl from snapchat it's like always a girl from something and then it started to be like oh you're the guest girl oh because i'm just at the campaign that they put everywhere yeah and then someone would just come up and say my name correctly which was really cool <laughs> yeah. so i was like you got it right <laughs> have you had any problem with stalkers no, but I don't want to put it. Where's wood? Yeah, here. <laughs> Three times. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, luckily not. I mean, I've gotten a ton of weird messages before, but you just kind of ignore them. Yeah. But overall, I, I feel like when people mostly come up to you, they either want a selfie or just to say thank you or just show appreciation, which was, which was nice. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. And I don't want to be suggestive, so let's move on from that topic. <laughs> if it hasn't yeah. been a problem, then we don't want to make it a problem. So what are you doing with guests? Well, I started working with them in spring 2018, and I launched um, their first athleisure line with them for their campaign. And yeah. that sold out for them, so they were super excited. Yeah. And um, then I did four more campaigns over the summer and then just launched my global campaign with them for fall. When you make a deal like that with them, is that something that they do through your channels on your platform and through their outlets and campaigns? Is it both, one or the other? How does that work? Yeah, it works for both. So they do their traditional normal campaigns that you see like the billboards and magazines and uh -huh. in stores and then they do it over digital as well so they have a huge like they they love the idea of social media i mean what brand doesn't know yeah. but <laughs> yeah they do it both ways so you're doing billboards and in store posters and stuff like that yeah and it's so exciting for me because it was a brand that i've loved since high school and i remember yeah. seeing those billboards and i was like oh that's so cool and they gave me the um the biggest billboard they've ever done in europe so it's like the size of a skyscraper in wow. turkey i was like that's insane yeah. <laughs> that's really cool that's got to be fun yeah i went and saw it and i did like a, a whole bunch of stuff with them to launch the campaign out there did you ever think when you sat down and started doing six second vines that you would wind up with a skyscraper size billboard in a foreign country? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I knew I have big goals and I haven't really reached them all yet. So for me, it's like, yeah. I better keep growing and I better keep doing really cool things. What are your goals? What are you going to do next? I want to do um, more film and TV. I feel like that's why I started initially. So mm -hmm. it's a, a big focus of mine. I signed with ICM for traditional just because it still needs the agency aspect of it and they're great. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's even producing and packaging my own shows as well. I think that's completely possible now, especially with a, oh, a built in yeah. audience. So, yeah. So, how do you protect your brand? Because I have people that do that full time, mm. they do nothing but get up in the morning and scrub the internet and take down fake clickbait ads, take down false accounts, just a problem a every day, all day. Does that happen to you? Yeah, there's probably thousands of fake accounts of me on Facebook, on Instagram, on everywhere. But for me, I'm like, oh, it's fine. Like, I, I don't really pay attention to it. Like, let them keep posting my content, whatever. It just gets, like, some of them even have close to a million followers on really? their accounts. And I, the verification really helps nowadays. So verif being verified on Instagram and on Facebook. So it lets people know this is a legitimate account and the main account. So it's not really as big as an issue as it once was. So for me, I don't really pay a lot of attention yeah. to it. Do you have anybody that 
uses you as a fake endorsement of something they're doing? Oh, yeah. So I have uh, I have some lawyers that, like, go and put claims on those things, and they handle all that. I'm like, uh, just anything you see my name on that it shouldn't be there, Yeah. get rid of it. Like, because that's that's really influential. I mean, it's like if people walk and see my face on it, must be a brand or a product that I endorse and I think is great, and I have a lot of influence over my audience, so it's... And that's a lot of people. (laughs) I got to be careful with that. We've seen it where they take either me or Robin Mm -hmm. and they'll say, we have a product or something. And they say, this is free. And sometimes elderly people will click on that and they get their credit card number and enroll them in something that automatically renews. And we've gotten letters from these people that are 80 years old fixed income, and these phony people are hitting their accounts for $109 a month, Mm. and they don't know how to get out. And they don't have $109 a month. I mean, that's the difference between them eating and not eating. Yeah. Then when you go track them down, they shut down and open up under another name somewhere else, and they just bleed them dry. It's crazy. There's so many scams out there, and like I feel like that does happened a lot on Facebook too with the the fake accounts but you know that's why I always just put a message out there too just saying if it's a message coming from me most likely isn't from me because I don't even use my DMs to talk to friends so it's like I'll text you you know yeah when you see these things that are happening on Facebook right now with them getting hacked personal information Mm -hmm. being given to people should there be more security on the internet right now um, yeah, I, I think there always should be. Uh, everybody's information is either on their phones, like their identities, like their bank accounts, everything. So there definitely should be the most security on the internet, even more so than your home. You know, if people get access to some of those, inf- some of that information, it can really ruin your life. So. Yeah. When you see these things, and I ask you this because you're so involved in the internet and these platforms. Do you think there should be more policing of content that's out there? We see things like revenge porn. Mm. We see things like cyberbullying. I've been to Capitol Hill to modify the Elementary and Secondary Education Act to put money into the curriculum to deal with cyberbullying mm-hmm. because kids just can't get away from it. Do you think there should be more policing of that kind of content than there is? I I would say yes. Or is it even possible? Yeah, I don't that's, know. Yeah, that's what my question is. Because I, I feel like anytime you give with any social platform, it's it's really, unless you turn off commenting and messaging and it can only have likes and positive, you know, a positive app like that. But people love drama too. So they love the ability to be able to comment. And I don't think that's ever really going to go mm-hmm. away because a lot of people are self-destructive as well like naturally so but I, I think it is a huge issue for kids I mean me as an adult reading some of those comments is like that makes you want to cry almost I can imagine what it yeah. does to children um you know and it's a uh, suicide's a real thing and especially with kids like a, a lot of times they don't even go to their parents and what their friend says or comments is like their entire world So, yeah, I think it's a lot more about parent supervision on these apps and stuff because you can't wait for something to change or to do it. So really paying attention to what your kids are doing. And I know it's difficult because they are like using the phone when you're not looking and stuff, too, and Mm -hmm. you can't control what other kids are saying. But I think it's like, you know, maybe that's part of my job, too, as as an influencer for a younger demographic is being able to talk about spreading kindness and how impactful words are but I think it's just all education and even telling your kids words are just words. I see so many stories where I think kids have actually been cyber bullied to death. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up bullying took place at school. Maybe it was in the lunchroom or it was on the bus dock where the buses came and picked the kids up or behind the gym. And when the kid went home, they were away from all of that. Mm -hmm. But now they go home and they're still on their computer. They go to the same platforms that everybody at school goes to. 
and their parents can think they're back in their room on the computer doing assignments or homework. Mm -hmm. And there are people back there saying, everybody hates you. Why don't you kill yourself? Yeah. Or they can change schools because of the bullies. But the bullies go with them to the next school. Yeah. So they're really 24-7. They cannot get away from them. Yeah. And that's a problem. And I don't know what the answer is, but they're getting bullied literally to death. Yeah. No, it's, it's something that is an issue. And a lot of kids like... <laughs> It's, kids can be the biggest bullies of them all, too. It's not like a lot oh, of the hate. cruel. Yeah. And honestly, like a lot of the comments that I saw were just like so aggressive were from children. Like, I'm like, you're eight years old. How do you know that yeah. word? And how do you have yeah. a phone? Like, I had to buy my phone. Like, yeah. <laughs> where'd you get yours from? But um, so just seeing that, it's like it's a way f for kids that have aggression to just to let it out, which Sometimes, okay, maybe that's a good thing. But when it's towards other people, it's then you're hurting other people as well. So it's like, I don't know. I think it's something that, you know, either the schools and parents, like, but some people don't have the best parenting or the best things at home. So something that should be enforced as well, like, you know, make it a part of the, the school systems also. It's like you get punished the same way if you were to do it in school. Well, of course, Teachers will tell you, well, it happens off campus, so we can't do anything about it. Yeah. I just throw the flag on that yeah. because it may happen off campus, but it's happening by the kids in your class. Mm -hmm. It's happening in your sociogram, even though it's off the school grounds. This is the group that you're in control of, you're policing. And the fact that it happens on the other side of the street doesn't mean you don't have anything to do with it. You're the one that has the ability to consecrate it, mm -hmm. and they're not doing it. That's what I had to say when I went to Washington. They got yeah. they got to change what they're doing about that. I've seen the term Instagram girls mm -hmm. <laughs> that are really young, mm -hmm. but they're putting up really provocative pictures. Yeah, the statistics are that these girls aren't on the internet an hour before some predator is engaging them oh in some gosh, way. Oh, my gosh. Jeez. Obviously, they think they're talking to a 14-year-old boy, uh. but in fact, it's a 38-year-old creep with a windowless van who's trying to get them off the Internet into the real world where they can take advantage of them. It's like almost like don't let your kids use social media. Well, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's scary, particularly like, if they're... I don't they're... have kids, but... If they're putting really provocative pictures up and they're 14 or 15 and they don't have the ability to see around corners, I think kids have the knowledge to use the Internet, but not the wisdom. Yeah, I think it, maybe it's a course, you know, maybe to be able to use an app, you have to yeah. go through this like it's like sex ed, you know, <laughs> like that's naturally going to happen. Social media is naturally going to happen with kids. So well, you bring up a good point because. When I went to school, we had to take shop, mm -hmm. where we learned how to weld. We had to take <laughs> home ec, where we learned how to cook and all of that. And we had to go through sex ed. Mm -hmm. Maybe now there needs to be in the curriculum some kind of cyber sex education where you realize what the dangers are and how to recognize if you're being groomed in a chat room or yeah. whatever. They still call them chat rooms. I don't know. DMs is yeah, like DMs, the slang for it. Direct messages. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. All right. No, I think that's a great idea, though. Like, you know, it's even for, I think everybody has had a moment online where they've been scammed or almost scammed. Like, I've had all my accounts hacked before because I'm like, oh, I got an email. Oh, what's that? What's that link for? Yeah. <laughs> ah! It was like everything just gets hacked at once and you're like, oh my gosh. But it's even more serious when it's actual little girls getting like having these predators <laughs> come after them. It's just disgusting. I had a story recently where a girl had been talking to a guy. She totally thought he was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. She says, look, my parents, they're mean. They don't treat me right. They won't give me this. They won't give me that. And he's, of course, saying, that's terrible. I can't believe they treat Tell her everything she wants to hear. Mm -hmm. And finally, he talks her into going out the window. Just go out your window. I'll meet you down by the mall. And she does. And she gets there. 
and the guy's 38 years old. Oh my gosh. And he walks up and she goes, oh my God, I mm-hmm. thought you were 14. And he says, no, I'm 38, but I'm totally in love with you. And I God. know your parents don't love you. Like I, He actually talks her into staying. They leave and they're on the run for four months. What? The fact that she was found alive was astounding. Yeah. But the story that she tells, she wants to go home after two or three days. He won't let her. I mean, yeah. she just gets abducted and it goes across state lines. But even when she finds out he's not 14 years old, still, she's groomed. Mm -hmm. He talks her into it. We've got to educate him in some way. Some of these pictures they put up are pretty provocative. Yeah. But I wouldn't wouldn't even blame it on the provocative pictures. Oh, no. It's not that. Sometimes they're not even pictures. It's just that they're putting up. Posts that lure people. Yeah, they're just starting to tell them what they want to hear. Mm. They're just saying, hi, you know, yes, your parents don't love you. I love you. They just groom them, tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. And they study. They look and see what are 14-year-olds into right now? What Mm. video games are they playing? What music do they like? (laughs) Exactly. And they mimic all of that so they sound like a 14-year-old, and that's how they lure them out. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it has to be education. There's really no other... I, I don't I don't see any other true solution to it other than just no social media. Like if it does it's not there, but then it's they're gonna find their kids. They're gonna yeah. find a way to use it somehow, whether it's them at school using a friend's phone. It's like so I think education is the best weapon to give somebody. You think parents ought to track where their kids are going on the internet? Yeah. Yeah, if the parents I I would. <laughs> Especially after hearing those stories, I definitely yeah. If like, you had a kid, you would track where they're going? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I know privacy is a thing, and you need to give your kids, like, that freedom and trust them and stuff, too. But it's not that you don't trust your kids. It's like, like you said, there's predators online that are more readily available than even in person. So letting them go to the movies is a lot safer than letting them on social media sometimes. So oh, No doubt about that. Yeah. I think it's fortunate that you haven't had somebody creeping (laughs) you're just really putting that out there no i just (laughs) i think it's fortunate and i think that's because you curate what you put out there Mm -hmm. you monitor it you respond to certain people and not other people but that's what i say kids have the knowledge but not the wisdom yeah you've got both because you've been out there a long time Mm -hmm. so that makes a difference and you've put up like three thousand comedy skits yeah I have a lot of content. Like I probably at one point I was doing minute long videos every single day, new videos for a year on Instagram. And I was growing at over a million fans a month just because of my consistent, consistent content. So it's a lot of (laughs) different ideas too. So tell me about this new video on demand service called Zeus. Oh yeah. Yeah. I started that with um, my best friend, Andrew Batchelor. He's known as King Batch online. So me and Batch and then um, our friend Daystorm Power, who's been doing YouTube forever. So we were like, all right, that's a good fit. And we all work great together. And then we partnered up with Lemuel Plummer, who's like Uh more of a traditional guy. He came from doing a lot of more reality series and has his own production company. And then we have a tech partner as well to kind of like give it a platform to live on. So we created created our own SVOD platform. So it's more so a lot of influencers have these big ideas that they want to create and they just don't know how. And that was something that I found at the beginning when I first started social media. I was like, how do I find like a videographer? How do I find an editor? Or how do I get a big production or how do I put that all together? And so we're kind of solving that problem for a lot of influencers and saying okay giving them a lot of creative freedom and control and being like you you've grown your own audience you've proven that you have a creative idea all right let's do it we'll give you full production and we'll have a platform for it to live on so this is like toys r us yeah a to z it's like (laughs) they get everything they need yeah there how's it going great really well like the influencers are super excited about it um and we have even like traditional talent too. a lot of actors are reaching out now because they want their own shows or their own series on the platform and they all like you said earlier want to be in this space now so 
it's it's really exciting because it's people that you would be like, oh, like it'd be cool to work with them. Now they're reaching out to work with you. So it's it's great. Like I say, I've run into so many young people who want to do it and have no idea how to do it. This mm-hmm. is some place they can go where they actually get the tools, they mm-hmm. get the knowledge, and they got some place to put it. Yeah, and it's fast. Like we're yeah. so used to filming, like filming content, getting it out, and that's similar to kind of what we're doing with Zeus, but we have a larger team to do it, so the quality and the production value goes way higher than what we're putting out on our YouTube and our, our Facebook right now and our Instagram. So you get that quality content, but also it's you don't have to wait a year for it to come out. You yeah. don't have to wait two years to shoot it. When you talk about content, you approach it differently than other people because it's not just about how many people click on what you put up. It's really about engagement, yeah. right? It's about how much people get involved with your content. Talk about that. Yeah, I think engagement is everything. You can have, I see some people that have like 50 million followers and they get like 10 likes on a photo. So I'm like, or not really 10, like 10,000 or something. Proportionately, it's not much. Yeah. So it's like, for me, that's a telltale sign of, okay, the, either the followers were bought or they just haven't been posting and lost the uh, like maybe they spiked at one point in their career and just all of a sudden gained a ton of followers. Now they just don't care as much anymore. But a lot of the times it's bot followers. But I think when you're able to get an audience to engage, like that shows you're able to get your audience to take action. So I think it's really important for brands to look at engagement of somebody's audience for even for film and TV. Like a lot of times they're casting influencers or actors from social media or that have some sort of social following so that's why a lot of actors nowadays seem okay I need to grow my social following I've had like so many people come up to me and say this before I'm like well start making content every single day and I'll put you in my stuff if you're a good actor because why not for anybody just looking at somebody's following just don't look at the numbers yeah you hear I have so many million but look at how many people are commenting, how many people are liking, because that really shows how much influence and how good your content is. People can watch it and hate it. So. And the way you get engagement is by being engaged. Yeah. You got to be active, be involved personally. Yeah, for sure. Because it just adds to the experience for the, for the user. So if somebody's on there and they know they have a chance of you responding or actually seeing their comment and their comment didn't go to waste, of course, they're going to start commenting more. It's just kind of how would you feel, you know? <laughs> yeah. People are getting their information so much on the internet. It seems to me if you have a big body of content and you curate it in a way that makes it easily accessible for what they want, mm-hmm. that that's a big deal where it makes it easy for them to find what yeah. they're looking for. You can't make them have too much work to yeah. get to what they want. You'll lose them. We try to improve that all the time. Last year, we put up video content from Dr. Phil. Mm-hmm. And last year, we had 1.8 billion views Amazing. on our content. And we're curating it much better mm-hmm. this year than we did last year. and. If you're looking for stuff on teens, you're looking for stuff on anxiety, you're looking for stuff on marriage. So we're curating it into categories like that, and we're immediately seeing an increase Mm -hmm. where we project we may this year hit like 2.5 billion instead of 1.8 billion. Crazy. That's great. By making it easy for people to find what they're looking for. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. If people are doing the less clicks, the better especially if you can make your own little click funnels just to get to people to where they need to be. But um, otherwise, they'll get distracted in the process by something at home or like a pop-out ad from something else, and they'll be like, ooh, what's that? And they'll just go off in the other direction. So where's all this headed? Where's it going to be in five years? When I started Dr. Phil, the first text had not been sent. (laughs) There was no Instagram. There was no Snapchat. None of these things that now are dominating our lives did not exist because I'm in my 17th season. Yeah. And think about it. There was 2000. Congratulations, by the way. Yeah, I'm I'm happy about that. But 
I'm dealing with teenagers that are putting stuff on the internet. Mm. They don't realize that it never goes oh, away. Yeah. They'll put up something stupid and then they go to apply for college. The admission committee is going to pull that. They're going to Google their name. Yeah. Or if they go look for a job, HR is going to Google their name and mm-hmm. pull up that here they are hanging by their feet from a tree drunk. They're going to find that. So I have new challenges. Those things weren't there then. Where's it going? Where's it going to be in five years or 10 years? I think it's just going to increase even more. (laughs) Your list of problems are just going to keep growing. But I I think it's just, you know, it's something that people want. It's like whether you don't want it, you still consume it just because it's just so like you can't get your eyes off it. But I think it's just it it's going to keep growing. I think it's going to get there's definitely going to be monopolies that are kind of happening, whether it was social apps and there kind of already is, but yeah. it's just, maybe that will lead to better regulation of things. I don't know, but I don't know if those are ever a good thing, but <laughs> it'll, I think it'll just keep increasing. And it seems like a lot of people really like consume, consuming things that are more in real time. So live content or even just a lot of people use their phones now just to get out of their own world or just to, and they, whether or not they know it. So it's, yeah, and video games are huge too. So I just think it's going to be more and more and more. <laughs> Do you think it's made us become a narcissistic, voyeuristic society? Uh, yeah, but we probably were already. <laughs> it just had to be let out. But, yeah, I, but I mean, honestly, I see people put up videos of them brushing their teeth in the morning. <laughs> Come on, you don't need an audience for brushing your yeah. teeth. Post something worth looking but what at. what toothpaste is he using? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> it's like, I think it could be a great thing and a negative thing. It's all how you use it. And maybe that comes with the education. The more it increases, the more we have to educate and use it for good, not evil. It's a weapon. Yeah. But it's also, I've learned a lot on social media. Like those YouTube videos, some of them are great. I don't, <laughs> but who's to say there's somebody reputable to give me that information? But like how to videos I love, like, you know. Yeah, if they're accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you can blow your house up. But <laughs> Yeah, if it's telling you how to wire up your furnace, then you go like, oh, yeah, yeah. let's Whoops, see where this sorry. guy is. Oh, yeah, no, he knows nothing. <laughs> Which is a lot of the times the case, but there's yeah. some good accounts out there. <laughs> then people get stupider and stupider to get attention yeah. on the Internet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What is it? There was one guy that um, it's really, really sad and tragic, but he had his girlfriend shoot him um, with a gun so he can get more views. And I yeah. think it went, he had a bulletproof vest on. Yeah, I don't it remember. penetrated the vest. Yeah. So, and she and just got him. sentenced, I think, too, recently. Yeah. You got to really want to get a lot of likes to have yeah. somebody shoot you. But. People do this all the time. Like, I know, but then again, okay, jackass was a thing, right? Where they were just doing the most ridiculous right. stuff. But I really feel like those guys enjoyed it. Like, like, so, like, it wasn't so bad. You could see it was, like, natural for them to do this, <laughs> do these sort of things, just because they were, like, so hyped by it. It was, like, their own drug in a way. Yeah. But, um, so watching it was just super entertaining because you're just like, wow, like... <laughs> Good thing I'm not doing that. I do think it's made it worse because there's a bigger audience. It's yeah. the old joke in Texas. How do you start a Texas fairy tale? It's like, watch this. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they used yeah. to do. Get drunk and then yeah. here you go. Now there's an audience for it. So you got a right. whole lot more people saying, watch Egging this. You on and incentivizing yeah. it. Yeah. It's actually a guy that had an old Buick and he put, honest to God, put a jet engine in the trunk. Bolted what? it down, got a jet engine from a surplus store, and put it in the trunk of an old Buick, and he lit that son of a and they had it on film. It sits there and churns up and churns up, and they said he left the road at about 300. Oh, my God. Off into a canyon. They didn't find pieces of him big enough to put in a Ziploc oh bag. Oh, my gosh. I worry about these kids that just try to do the bigger trick. They try to, yeah. like, you know, jump off the roof into the pool. 
I can imagine. Like, even when I was younger, I was a lot more fear- fearless than I am now. Like, I yeah. was like, all right, let's do bungee jumping. Let's do this. Like, because you don't really know the consequences cons- consequences as much. But now I'm like, no, I'm good. Like, I'll just go to the beach or, <laughs> you know, I'm, good. I'm just chill. <laughs> I shouldn't say anything. I did crash a motorcycle making a video not too long ago. Oh, yeah? It wasn't no. for the internet, though. It was for James Corden. You hear that, oh, James, James Corden? I James did something with Corden. James before, too. For He came to our building, and he, he had us ride the— like, He likes putting people at risk, yes. that James guy. <laughs> he had this plan, like, hidden talents of celebrities, and so— the hidden talent was I used to race motocross, so they were going to have me pulling through the gates of my house and pop a wheelie up my driveway. No way. Uh, which I did, and we shot it. Everything went fine. We had it on film. Everybody had gone. <laughs> you did it because it was being filmed. <laughs> and we got the film, and we and everything was fine. After the crew left, now I'm there with some of my stunt friend buddies, and we're just jacking around, and... Everybody kept getting a little more stupid, and oh my gosh. I came down, and somebody had put a palm tree there that wasn't there the last time I came oh. up the driveway 30 seconds before, went over the handlebars. You look fine. Yeah, look well, good. I didn't look fine that day. <laughs> Crushed my shoulder and broke six ribs and spent a week in ICU. Oh, my gosh. Would you do it again? No. <laughs> That's one trial learning. Maybe it's those life lessons, and hopefully you get blessed like yeah. that to where you're, you survive it. See, the older yeah. you get, the slower you heal. Like yeah. when I was in my 20s, you take a bullet in the shoulder, you shake it off, you're yeah. fine by Monday. Yeah. Now I get a hangnail, it's a month. Oh, no. Is that why the motorcycles are in this room? Yeah. And not out on the street? That's mine, but it wasn't the one I crashed. But the keys are now buried somewhere on the property oh she won't tell me d- where they oh, are i knew it yeah, <laughs> yeah she took them she won't tell me where they are see i i got a harley too um and i have my motorcycle license but i've heard so many stories about motorcycles and my dad used to drive them all the time growing yeah. up everybody i know either knows somebody or has been in an accident you you hate this right now <laughs> your yeah. face is just so <laughs> Like, all right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. there's two kind of motorcycle riders, yeah. those that have crashed and those that will crash. Yeah, yeah. I crashed in my driveway, so. <laughs> that was. But I do, it. you've seen my driveway. It's a long driveway. Yeah, you that's gotta true. Admit. And you doing a wheelie, that's awesome. It's not as stupid as it sounds that you crash in your own driveway, because it is a long driveway. Right. So that's a good excuse. Yeah, I guess so. So what's <laughs> next for you? What's your next big thing? I'm going to make some amazing movies that you're just going to love. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just do more film and TV stuff. And I'm also starting a couple of different companies, a little entrepreneur side of me. But I always have fun doing that, just growing brands that aren't of my own being. So Yeah, well, you've worked with some pretty big brands along the way. Yeah, learned a lot. <laughs> like Nike and Beats by Dre and Marc Jacobs and Ubisoft. You've worked with some really big brands mm-hmm. so far. So it's not like you're... a hurting for work no and it's nice too to be in that position so i don't have to grab onto everything that comes my way now i'm able to just do the things i actually yeah like that you want to do yeah yeah just nice. well you've worked very hard so you've you. learned that and this has been great because i think a lot of people wonder how you do what you do yeah and i think you've pulled the curtain back and let a lot of young people know that there's a lot of work that goes into this. It's yeah. not just a matter of getting on there and saying hi. Yeah, and that would be, I would have some kids that would come up to me too and just be like, all right, what do you want to do? Like, I, I want to be uh, famous on the internet. I'm like, with what? Like, why? <laughs> like, what are you going to do with that? It's like the fame part isn't the fun part of everything. For some people, okay, it is, but you have to have some sort of substance that you're bringing, whether it's you want to make people smile, you want to inspire people, okay? Like, yeah. you have to have something extremely unique, especially nowadays online. There's so much content out there now and so many different profiles, so. You got to rise above the noise. Yeah, and that's not doing trends. Like, you can't just see what the trends are and just follow that immediately. You have to do something completely different and to really stick out online so i believe in a defined brand i think you have to be distinct you have to be well defined and you got to commit to it 
It's like McDonald's Mm -hmm. and The Palm. They're two distinct brands. You're not ever going to walk into McDonald's expecting to get a lobster. You're not ever going to walk into The Palm expecting to get a Big Mac. (laughs) They're completely different, and they don't try to be each other. They're very defined brands, and they're both committed to who they are, and that works for them. And that's what people, I think, have to do. It's like Dr. Phil. You're not going to confuse me with anybody else. You may like me, you may hate me, but you do know what you're going to get. <laughs> Just great. Most like you, so <laughs> you don't have to worry. I'm to tell people the truth as I see it, yeah. and I'm going to give them common sense. If they don't like it, that's why they have a remote. Yep. <laughs> there you go. But now they have the internet, too, so. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you're everywhere. And a podcast. That's right. <laughs> you cannot escape me. I am everywhere. <laughs> Amanda, thanks for doing this. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Let's talk again soon. <laughs> for sure.